Precious metals are starting to sniff around that the Federal Reserve is really trapped. And it's trapped for many, many reasons. This is the chart of silver right now and the move that we had recently uh, in regards to the appreciation of silver prices uh, recently, looking back all the way to November of 2008. And as you can see, uh, this was a very uh, different type of daily move uh, that we saw. And certainly, I think it's, it's very telling for where we are in a cycle. Please enjoy this interview update with one of the sponsors of Liberty and Finance, Tectonic Metals. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And with us today, two very special guests. We have Tony Retta, the president and CEO of Tectonic Metals, and also Tavi Costa from Crescat Capital. Crescat is a major shareholder of Tectonic Metals. Tavi and Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, I wanted to discuss first what we're seeing in the metals market this week. Uh, a lot of volatility across all markets, but we saw a huge surge in both gold and silver on Monday. We've seen a bit of a pullback now, but if we could start with uh, Tavi's perspective on that, what is happening in the gold and silver markets right now? I think there's a lot going on in terms of, especially in the global economy right now, there's so many bombs kind of setting off in general and things happening and unfolding all at once in the global economy. And to me, we really need to see the global economy to collapse and have a, a real downturn uh, in order to drive precious metals a lot higher. Back in 08, for instance, we've had a big decline, a big increase in silver prices back in November of 2008. This was the largest increase that we had in prices in many, many years. And I think two days ago or so, we've had something very similar. And to me, this is very important because back in those days, that marked the bottom, not for the overall market, but for precious metals. And precious metals are starting to sniff around that the Federal Reserve is really trapped. And it's trapped for many, many reasons. This is the chart of silver right now and the move that we had recently uh, in regards to the appreciation of silver prices uh, recently, looking back all the way to November of 2008. And as you can see, uh, this was a very uh, different type of daily move uh, that we saw. And certainly, I think it's, it's very telling for where we are in a cycle. But more importantly, um, if you go back to this, and I, I think this is the most important chart uh, that really drives our views in terms of owning tangible assets in a day like today, and that's really what's happening with uh, the debt valuation and inflation. We call this a trifecta of macro imbalances. It's, it's the debt problem of the 1940s with the inflation problem of the 1970s with the valuation problem that we had in the late 90s. And those three imbalances are extremely important to understand the real political constraints that most policymakers are facing right now. And that's the whole reason why we think Inflation will continue to persistently infiltrate an economy. It's extremely entrenched and will continue to be so and will drive capital allocation for many, many uh, different uh, assets. One of them is going to be tangible assets, and you can dive into that. Most of them are going to be commodities. I mean, you have the value to growth transition. So a lot of things are going to be uh, you know, attracting capital. Remember, the commodity-led economies like Brazil. And so... I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities to invest in a very uh, difficult scenario for things like technology companies, overall equity markets that we think are they have a lot more downside to go. So it's it's a weird setup where you have this global economy sort of imploding, or really imploding, uh, but not yet dysfunctional. And the other side of it, there's all those other opportunities on the long side, mostly in the commodity space that I think is, is just one of the best opportunities that I've ever seen. And now turning uh, to Tony, if we could get your perspective on this. I know last time we had you on, you were talking about the miners are extremely undervalued. It seems like right now we may see the beginning of a move back up. Your perspective on what we saw this this week. <laughs> you most, most definitely. I mean, it is, you know, froth with uncertainty and fear. Um, you know, I constantly get question about the questions about the macro environment, environment but also about the, the junior mining markets, which is obviously the industry that I'm, I'm most concerned about and, you know, where things are going. And I know from past experiences, anytime I've tried to predict things, 
um, you know, from say Warren Buffett to myself or to Tavi, like, you know, no one's got the crystal ball. One thing that I do know is that we're definitely not at the top. You know, this feels like a bottom. Um, I look back to 2008 when things were quite dire. Um, and then the, the pull, the pullback was quite severe. And also the upswing was quite drastic as well. So this is, you know, this is more of a death by a thousand cuts, it feels like. And, uh, you know, this, you know, in the current situation that we're, we're in right now, you know, maintaining stability, you know, confidence in what you're doing, you know, obviously capital is extremely important and having supportive shareholders to ride out the storm. I do feel that the next quarter or the quarter after that and, you know, 2023, is definitely going to be a better opportunity than what we currently see right now. And you don't know till you're looking in the rearview mirror whether or not that was a good buying opportunity or not. So having a long-term approach to investing is what's needed right now. And when I look at the junior mining sector, as Tavi pointed out, as someone who's been in this industry since the age of 21, which is uh, 1995, I cut my first check and bought a mining stock, I have not seen valuations this low and sentiment this dire. And so from, from my perspective, if you do have capital, this represents an excellent buying opportunity. Not that next quarter is gonna be you know, a 10 bagger, but a long-term view is definitely, you know you wanna buy low? Well, we're currently in one of, the, one of those situations right now. And if we could turn back to Tavi now, because I would like to get your perspective at how is Crescat investing right now in this time where a lot of people are confused they don't know what is happening with the markets we're seeing a lot of volatility what are what is some words of wisdom that you could uh share with investors right now well i think first off we believe we're in entering the inflationary era so you have to approach portfolio positioning from that perspective i think and so inflation is not going to happen you know it's not going to be a straight line it's going to be it's probably going to happen through waves like we saw back in the 70s and thinking about portfolio construction, in our view, you want to be long inflationary assets and you want to be hedging things that are extremely expensive. The 70s analog is very good, but while commodities outperform equities and we've had other things like emerging markets doing better than developed economies and so forth, even the housing market did better than the stock market. But today, I think there's a, a, a lot of differences uh, with the 70s. Uh, we didn't have the debt problem that we had back then. Uh, that we have today. And I think the second thing that we didn't have back then was the valuation problem. Valuation of equities were actually cheap uh, relative to where they are today. And so, and I'm speaking broadly, right? It's not just one sector. There are all types of sectors in economy today from consumer discretionary to staples, utilities, technology still look expensive relative to their history. So in our opinion, it's important to be hedged on that side of the position. So what is an inflationary portfolio or asset side of a portfolio look like? Uh, we have lots of commodities. So we have a basket of things. Uh, number one, the most important one, which I think it's the most inefficient part of the markets today, uh, has to do with the precious metals market. And the way we express that view is with companies uh, like Tectonic. And so you, you have been buying a lot of exploration assets. Companies uh, that own very prolific ground, uh, that have great technical teams, uh, that can really, uh, can really de deliver a lot of success uh, from an exploration perspective. Uh, that's one of our biggest parts of our portfolio, also in the base metals too. The second thing has been energy. We own a lot of energy companies, mostly mid-cap and large-cap companies. Agricultural commodities is another portion of it. We own most of fertilizers, uh, but also a lot of agricultural commodities on the physical market as well. And the last part on the long side has to do with economies that are commodity-led economies that look incredibly cheap today. And that one of them that I've been growing confidence and starting to speak more about has been the Brazilian economy. We've been buying Brazilian assets, especially now with the whole turmoil and political environment. It's something we really, really like. And so we've been building a position in Brazilian assets too. And then on the short side, we have right now a lot of mega cap shorts. Uh, we think most mega cap companies are probably the next shoe to drop. Uh, and so we've had software companies and, and ARC investments all reached, you know, basically March lows levels. Uh, DocuSign, you know, great software example 
Uh, Chinese stocks are now at six-year lows. So those are roadmaps, in our opinion, to the overall market, which we think is going to reach also, ultimately, uh, the March lows of that uh, 2020. And you know, some, some of those stocks are still 30%, 40% away from those, those, uh, those levels. And so there's quite a lot of opportunity on the short side still. Credit spreads, we think credit spreads are going to blow out. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, so we have shorts and corporate bonds. Um, I think treasury markets are yet to become dysfunctional, so there's more shorts on the treasury market. So that's a whole basket of shorts on the one side. Um, and we are long the dollar, believe it or not, even though we have a long inflation uh, portfolio, we, we have some long dollar positions like long the dollar versus the Chinese yuan. Why? Because the commodity net importer, um, you have other economies like the Hong Kong dollar. And so just to give you a sense of what our portfolio looks like. So that's really long inflation, inflationary assets with shorts uh, in order to hedge that trade. It's, it's a, simplistically speaking, it's just being long commodities and short stocks. You mentioned the dollar strength, and I know that's been somewhat, at least recently, putting pressure on precious metals. Do you see that to continue or that uh, reversing sometime soon? I think it's unsustainable. Um, you know, I don't see it reversing anytime soon here, but it's unsustainable indeed. Um, there's going to have to be some sort of coordination at some point. And that's really because we're seeing three issues happening all at once I, that I also don't remember seeing it, which is central bank liquidity drying up. So this withdrawal of liquidity from central banks, which is something we haven't really lived through in the last 20, 30 years. So a lot of investors are confused with this. Um, you know, we've, we've had a, a, a backdrop in the macro environment of, of excess liquidity to help most of those risky assets to continue to be propped up by that liquidity. That's not what we're seeing now. Um, number two is the dollar move. Uh, and, and I, you know, in my view, it's been always our view that the dollar is, is you know, it's probably um, uh, the best currency relative to others. But uh, you know, it kind of surprised us a little bit how much of a move that we saw, not going to lie. Um, the Japanese yen was, you know, shorts and British pound is still a short for us and so forth. So we, we still have positions, maybe not as big as they were prior in prior years, uh, as they have moved in our favor. And the third thing that has been happening is the interest rate move. The interest rate move is real. It has to do with the policy rate divergence. Uh, from the Federal Reserve really tightening conditions relative to other countries that are not doing enough, like the PBOC having to ease monetary conditions in an inflationary environment, or the Japanese yen having to buy uh, JGBs in an inflationary environment, or the BOE, the Bank of England, having to buy gilts, their government bonds, in order to suppress cost of debt. And so those three things happening are very bad for the global economy. So it's, it's hard to believe the consumer is not approaching a breaking, uh, a breaking point. And so I know this sounds very bearish, but it unleashes a lot of opportunities. And so we're bearish in, in that part of it. And we think the dollar will continue to be uh, strong relative to those currencies. But ultimately, it's really buying gold relative to the most overvalued currencies in the world. It's not really buying the dollar. It's just hedging that gold inflation position uh, with currencies that we think are extremely overvalued. And there are many of those out there. No, it does seem right now that the positions in gold that investors have is very low. It's not a popular asset at the moment. And a lot of people are looking for that to increase. Uh, but then that also asks the question of, you know, uh, in, where is the gold going to come from? And, it, and I know you've talked about, Tavi, how there's a need for more exploration going on. Can you speak on the need for like a new renaissance in exploration? And also, Tony, if you had any thoughts on that as well. Yeah, the miners are cheap, right? I mean, you look at dividend yields, miners, just a, a funny aspect. I mean, div they're paying more dividends in, in, in giving back, doing buybacks than what they do in capex, meaning they're giving more money back to shareholders than what they do in terms of investing in their own businesses. So they are freaking out, literally, right? I mean, you look at the majors, the insiders, the folks that work for those big major companies, they are not even buying their own stocks. And so this industry is almost like left behind. That's my two cents on this whole industry. But there are a lot of inefficiencies and guys like Tony are just exceptions. 
And so, you know, if you look at geoscience enrollments for universities, they've been in a secular decline. You know, ask Tony how many people uh, he can find that are prospectors, that are young. There aren't any, right? So it's very difficult. We're going to go through a supply cliff issue where most of the majors are still depleting their reserves and not replenishing them. And so we need to be investing in companies like Tectonic. And there are many of those out there. Well, there are many of them that are just trash, let's be honest. And there are a few of those that are incredible investments. And so in our opinion, it's, it's time to be deploying capital in this part of the industry and being very selective, geographically speaking, and also with good management teams that can deliver. And I think Tectonic is just one of them. And, and so it's part of our portfolio. Uh, and maybe, maybe Tony can share a little bit about you know, the thesis behind it, because I think it's just, you know, it's a, it's a true opportunity that I think majority of, of investors are too focused on the gold and silver prices and not focused on building a portfolio that can really build wealth in call it, you know, three to five to 10 years from now. Thank you for that. I, th I think when I, not I think, when I, when I look at Crestcat or your investments and you speak about buying Brazilian assets and buying junior mining equities, the thing that keeps popping up in my mind is value investing. You know, they said going, going back to buy, buy low, so high. I remember my father always told me when I started investing and then started buying my first, uh, first home, he said, you always make money on the buy. You never make money on the sell. And I think junior mining equities going back to to that theme, there is value to be had. Now, you know, buying a growth stock, you know, you can still make money on that front too, but you make money on the buy. And so to your point also about the major mining companies needing to replace their ounces that they currently are depleting each day that they're in production, you can see the cost of M&A, these acquisitions, before there was a, a hypothetical or a theoretical number of $100 per ounce. And you look at the Great Bear acquisition as of late, they paid a multitude higher than that. Kamenak Gold, our company that uh, we were previously involved with prior to Tectonic and the Coffee Gold Project, that was paid at a premium. So when these fantastic discoveries happen or these economic, uh, these deposits turn into economic deposits, they're going to be highly coveted by the major mining companies and they're going to be paying uh, a premium, a significant hefty premium to, to purchase them. And to sort of segue into tectonic on that front, you know, we think we, you know, all our projects have to tick a certain, certain, uh, a bunch of different boxes. And one in particular, our latest acquisition called the Flat Gold Project is an asset that represents a tier one opportunity in a tier one jurisdiction. And again, the flight to, to homegrown versus, you know, um, risky political jurisdictions, you know, is quite relevant, not just from the investment perspective or investor perspective, but also from the major mining perspective. So we target, you know, large scale gold systems that have the ability or to or the potential to turn into tier one deposits. And our flat project is a great example of that. I would also highlight that deposit style and a, and a new discovery that's transpired in our space about uh, I would say about a month and a half ago. And this is a great example of what discovery can do to the share price. So I, I mentioned the, the flat gold project. And so the type of system that represents is an in bulk tonnage intrusion related gold system. And then when anyone's making any sort of investment decision, or even from a CEO or VPX, Vice President of Exploration perspective, when you're doing your target generation, you want to know that the target, you know, what does the end product look like? You know, if this if this comes to fruition and we do all the right things and Mother Nature cooperates, what's the end product? Well, the end product with flat and say Snowline, for example, these are an uh, and Dolan. Um, these are development stage. Well, sorry, Dolan is a development stage project. Snowline is that brand new gold discovery, and tech, uh, flat is a project that we've yet to drill, but has 50 historical drill holes. And the end game is these bulk tonnage intrusion related mines, such as the Fort Knox mine which is one of Kinross's most profitable mining production. Another one there that you see on the top right is the Eagle Gold Mine. That's owned by Victoria. So that's the end game. These projects can work in, in the North. They're highly coveted and they represent a tremendous amount of size. Uh, for the Fort Knox Gold Mine, for example, has been in production for, for you know, over 10 plus years now. Um, current reserves are 2.8 million ounces with an average grade of 0.3 grams per ton. Now, previously, this was a higher grade, higher grade operation, 
But great is just one, one aspect. You have to look at the metallurgical recovery, the strip ratio, open pit versus underground, infrastructure, all these things funnel into the what makes a project economically viable, what makes a mine economically viable. And the latest discovery that I was mentioning is the snow mine gold discovery. And you can see here that um, you know they're trading roughly in and around 80 cents. They announced their first few drill holes, fantastic drill results. And that stock catapulted all the way up to $4. It's now hovering around the $3 to $3. 20 cent range. And I believe Crestcat was one of the early investors that, you know, through their technical expertise, not only with Tavi and Kevin, but the geological te technical expertise that Quinton brought to the table, he identified a fantastic team, uh, a tier one jurisdiction, and also great geology and the potential for that geology to turn into what you see here, which is now a 375 million dollar market cap company on a few holes so <clears throat> we like snowline position our projects at the discovery stage and so that's when you can go from moose pasture to something economic and as you can see here on the, on this slide here <clears throat> that concept to pre-discovery is in the initial phases and what we have here is the value proposition on the left hand side you go into that discovery phase and that's where things can get really, you know, excitement, enthusiasm, everyone comes charging into the stock. Then you go into the resource stage and then it tends typically the share price tends to, to trickle down and you go into this sort of, uh, you know, feasibility uh, development stage and then it ramps up in production. Most M&A typically happens uh, in the resource or more specifically, I would say actually in the feasibility stage. So that's when you do your first economic engineering study on the project and that usually you know the project is relatively de-risked and that's where the majors uh tend to uh come in and, and gobble you up the great bear example for uh, for example they actually never put out a compliant resource but anyone with any technical wherewithal and perhaps if you also had a non-disclosure agreement and had access to that database you can start modeling and get a sense of what the size potential was the Kamenak coffee gold project acquisition that happened at the feasibility stage. We're about to dip our toe in the permitting front. Gold Corp steps up and bought us for 520 million. So the sweet spot of the team and the sweet spot of projects that we like to acquire is in this sort of discovery stage. And that's what FLAT um, brings to the table is a project that has 50 historical drill holes. It's, uh, has, it's blessed with infrastructure, which is extremely important. Again, from an economic and development perspective, we have an airstrip that can accommodate a HERC. We have roads from the airstrip to site, and also the topography is quite subdued. This is a plateau with rolling hills. And if you look at the mineral endowment of the uh, flat project, that is extremely important. Going back to, you know, how do you identify an opportunity, whether it's snow line or flat in the early days, you want to look for big, you know, a big deposit, big system. So how do you do that? Well, big deposits leave big footprints. And in this case, we have 1.4 million ounces that's been produced in the placers, uh, in the streams and creeks. And the source for that is this target called Chicken Mountain, which is highlighted here in yellow. That's the golden soil anomaly, which is over four kilometers long. So that hilltop over you know, millions of years has eroded and every stream and tributary that you see here has gold in that. And that's remarkable. One creek, for example, 650,000 ounces, you know, that's placer production. So that's <clears throat> just quite astonishing. Um, and then you zoom in a bit further. So we have the placer mining production, but we now have a golden soil anomaly and golden soil anomalies, especially in unglaciated terrains such as this one here, they can represent a system that's below your feet. And here we have four kilometers of strike where two, the soils are uh, north of 200 parts per billion. And to translate that into somewhat more layman's terms, that's 0.2 grams per ton in soil. And if you recall, the Fort Knox mine, they're mining 0.3, but they're putting that ore on a leach pad. And so again, the big deposits leave big footprints. We see that here. The other thing that you also want to look at is, you know, what are what are the grades look like? And grade is just one element. Metallurgical recovery is another is, is the other side of the equation. And then we have 
Is it open pit? Is it underground? Are we work? Is the department of the working for us or against us? And you can see here, there's a suite of drill results from 12 and a half grams over 24 meters, all the way to 0.98 grams over 76. Another thing to note is that your average open pit three million mine, the average grade of that is 1.1 grams per ton. Your average grade for a heap leach open pit operation is 0.65. So we're excited about the drill results historically because they demonstrate size. We're excited about the soil anomaly, but we're also excited about the metallurgical opportunity because if you can demonstrate that this is not only a three million opportunity, but a heap leach opportunity in a first world jurisdiction, heap leach mines have lower grades, um, usually lower capex, uh, lower energy costs, and extremely coveted by major mining companies. So flat represents an, an, a, a direct opportunity that we can go in next year and drill this asset and you know, follow up on 12 and a half grams over 24 meters. We know where we have to put the drills, and there's a direct path forward to a resource estimate. The project's been de-risked because we have the 50 drill holes. It's been de-risked because we have evidence support to support 3 million from the plaster mining perspective, but also from some historical MET tests. We also have an agreement with the landowner, which is one of Alaska's largest native corporations. And that's a full-scale production agreement. That's something that you can take that agreement and run with into production. And furthermore, the uh, landowner is also our second largest shareholder. So we have alignment on the ESG front. And these are all de-risking elements that make a project extremely attractive and much more streamlined to uh, demonstrate its economic viability. Just to mention one thing, when he was, Tony was showing the Lausanne curve, where you kind of go through the cycles of mining, majority of the millionaires, I should say the billionaires in this industry actually made their money in that speculation period of the, um, of, of the exploration phase. And so that's absolutely critical, um, in my view, to, to look for those opportunities, especially in a day like today, when you're able to find companies actually kind of like Tectonic, where they've got historical drilling already data um, of, of discovery holes, and you still have to just follow up on those. And there are many uh, other examples of those companies trading a very low uh, market cap value. And so you're able to uh, find a lot of uh, companies uh, that have a much higher probability of finding a discovery, trading at valuations of companies that have nothing in their ground. And so that's the key here is, is sort of a venture capital approach where you're really betting for one or two or three winners and a bunch of losers. However, you're able to buy majority of those companies with a much better probability because of today's market prices that are so depressed. And so you're able to build a portfolio of ideas of companies that are already onto major discoveries. And so, and their probabilities of, of continuing to find those minerals and defining those resources um, are really high compared to what the market is saying that, that those probabilities really are. And so the way we approach this is it starts from the geology part, which I am not a geologist, and so isn't Kevin. But we do work with a guy whose name is Quentin Haney which I think is one of the smartest guys in the industry. And he's the one who really discerns the geology side for us. Once the geology checks, then we go through the due diligence process of the company itself. It's meeting with management. It's making sure they are open-minded to work uh, with us. Uh, we usually try to bring as much value as we can. Tectonics is actually a great example of that. We've worked together on helping them to make decisions when, it's, when, when they need help, um, helping them to find expertise, not the case here with Tectonic necessarily, but other stories where we brought uh, other folks to work with those teams. Uh, we've had Quinton designing drill holes uh, in other projects, not necessarily this one. Actually, my, Quinton might actually have his, uh, someone his hands on 
uh, on some of, of that, uh, you know, even though, again, it, it, we're always working with very capable teams. And the key is, is finding that open-mindedness of finding, uh, you know, folks and management and technical teams that are able uh, to work with us. Uh, and, and that's just a subjective uh, metric, uh, but it's an important one. And you can only tell that uh, by meeting with those folks. Um, one thing we find is, is that unfortunately, there are a lot of good assets in the wrong hands. And so the approach we take is not so much cleaning up companies. Uh, we're not looking for those turnaround plays, even though I do think there's a lot of opportunities there as well. Um, and so the other thing we do is to look for uh, geographic locations that were really attractive. Um, and, and there are many of those, right? The Golden Triangle is one of them. Alaska is another one. Newfoundland is another one. Yukon is now a hot area for us. It's been for the prior year or so. Um, I would say some parts of Brazil, Bolivia, you know, Bolivia is sort of a contrarian uh, opinion of, of a place that is not in a developed world uh, that we like, that we think it's opening up. Uh, we avoid places like Africa. Uh, we do think South America is, is more interesting than Africa in terms of jurisdiction. Uh, so we look for opportunities in those places, avoiding areas like Argentina, avoiding areas, obviously, like Venezuela. Uh, but, um, but there are places in South America that are going to be um, really interesting. It's the whole Brazil uh, bullish thesis that I was developing earlier. Uh, where I do think South America will play a big role into this supply shortage of things, uh, especially natural resources, into partnerships with uh, developed economies. We don't need to get into that. Um, I think the other thing has to do as well with finding management teams that have skin in the game. Um, you know, you have to find folks that are worried about diluting uh, their companies because they they are in the business of doing that. They're not earning. Uh, anything as of today. So they have to raise capital and drill and try to cre create value. That's, that's what the business that they are in. And so it's important to know where this capital is going to be spent, uh, how much capital do they need, the timing of raising that capital. All those questions are very strategic questions that we need to answer as part of the due diligence process of knowing we, if we should invest or not. And so, you know, I know it's just quite, kind of a long answer. And the other thing, I think it's a huge misconception or, or issue of most early beginners or, or investors in this, in, this, in this space has to do with chasing low grade and, and massive deposits. And, you know, just for the leverage of finding large reserves that are levered to the gold price. That is not what we're trying to accomplish. We're looking for um, assets that are going to be economically viable and scalable uh, to be purchased by the major companies. We want those projects to be uh, sellable uh, to those to those uh, businesses uh, because we do understand that there is a supply cliff uh, coming for most of the majors uh, that I said earlier that are depleting their capital, their reserves in order to generate free cash flow as of today. And so at some point, we're going to see that. And it's and not only precious metals, it's base metals too. And so in our opinion, it's, it's absolutely critical. You know, some of the, let's just say, some of the discoveries we've had in the last 10 years or so, which are very, uh, there are not too many of those, they can appreciate regardless of what's happening with gold prices. They can, they can create value. They can go through the speculation uh, a period that Tony was showing on the Lasson curve, disregard of what's happening in the macro environment. And that's because every investment we make, there are two aspects to it. There is the macro backdrop that can be very positive, but also the success of drilling. When you buy in a company, a property, uh, you know, basically they are uh, almost a real estate company at the beginning, trying to become a mining company. So if they find something, oh, wow, now, now we're on to something different here. And the, the, the beauty of all this is that, like I said earlier, you're able to find a ton of companies, not a ton of companies, but a number of companies, multiple uh, uh, projects out there that are onto major discoveries, but are not priced accordingly. 
And so that's key. I don't know if we're going to see those inefficiencies five years from now. So to me, I want to take advantage of this and I want to be positioned and I want to uh, position our portfolio as, as well as we can with the best companies that we can find. Tectonic is just uh, one example of those positions in our portfolio and uh, we're happy shareholders. And if we could then uh, turn to Tony, get your perspective on this, because it seems like what Tavi is saying is there's kind of two bullish factors here with respect to uh, certain, uh, you know, very uh, intentionally picked exploration companies that there's the backdrop of the macroeconomic environment that is pushing precious metals most likely higher in the near future, which can only be positive for gold exploration companies. But then there's also the fundamentals of the company itself that regardless of what the metal prices do, um, if it's a good company, it should perform. So your perspective on that? I, I really obviously am very much aligned with Crestcat and Tavi's approach. You want as much wind in your sales as possible. So identifying the macro thesis, you know, a higher gold price, you know, people, there's a lot of people that say, well, you're an exploration company, you don't produce gold. So how's a higher gold price going to impact you? Well, there, it's not linear, but a higher gold price creates a more positive environment and draws investors saying, okay, I want exposure to bullion, so I'm going to buy equities. The major mining companies start making more money. They start looking down the food chain and the, the institutions and funds also start shifting their, uh, their focus back into the resource space. So that backdrop is extremely important. Going back to the fundamentals of the company, can the fundamentals of a company and their projects outperform the macro? And a great example of that is going back to Snowline. And so Snowline in this, call it terrible market that we're in or uncertain market, you know, they announced uh, their, their first two, they announced that they were drilling, they um, announced visuals for the first two holes. And the visuals from a, you know, say you're a Quentin or a, ge a Quentin Henning type or a geologist, they're, it's pretty spectacular looking, looking drill core. So on those visuals, they raised $25 million in what is supposedly a terrible market. And, and that this is where the company's outperforming. That was, uh, Tavi might know exact, I think it was at $1.20 or $1.26 a share price, Tavi, something like that, do you recall? We, we were the largest participant of that, so yes, <laughs> we cut the okay. deal. <laughs> well, there, there, there you go. So you were in earlier also at like, like you know, yeah. 20, 30 cents. So then they, they announced this financing based on visuals at $1.26, and obviously the assays come out, they meet and exceed expectations, and the stock net, uh, continues to go to $4. Again, in a terrible market. The power of discovery, you know, regardless of the macro, this is where it you can outperform. You've got the right team, the right environment, the right geological setting. So why does the stock go to four dollars? Well, people like Quinton and other sophisticated people. There, yes, there's some euphoria in there as well, and let's just call it some some market uh, enthusiasm. But they start seeing visibility for a large scale gold system, and that's extremely rare. So now it's it's you know Snowline's job to obviously meet those expectations, and and Mother Nature will do what she does. But the bottom line is that this company and this drill program outperformed the macro. So that's one example of where, you know, it's important to look at the fundamentals. You can't disregard them. And I have a lot of, um, you know, I host educational workshops, things of that nature as well. And I have a lot of people come up, I can't understand, you know, the mining sector. It's way too technical. And it is. We are technical. We speak a different language than, than what most investors speak. But what I encourage people to, to do or investors to do is to look the uh, funds such as Crestcat that have access to technically smart people, and they've done the due diligence for you. There's other funds such as RCF. There, there's there's a whole slew of resource funds that they do have a say a financial uh, portfolio manager, or sometimes it's a geologist or an engineer. But they they access people of that caliber, geology, engineering, environmental. And they do the due diligence for you. So that's one way to sort of de-risk your investment choices by looking for shareholders that have that acumen. And so um, the other element is the people. And I always encourage people to, to reach out. You know, anyone, you know, you don't need a degree to assess a, a person's merit or worth. And also look at their past. Do they follow through on their word? Do they have integrity? Are they accountable for their actions? Um, things of that nature. And, you know, 
People might look at our share price too and say, well, you're a six and a half cents stock. Well, yeah, it, you know, we're down from 35 cents from 2018 to now. And, you know, was considered a terrible market. If you look at our performance just within the last like six to 10 months, we've actually outperformed most. But the reality is we're, we're a $10 million market cap com company. And I take full ownership of that. <clears throat> and not only do I say that with my saying, like verbally saying that I take ownership, I also have my entire life savings into this company. And so I have no choice but to make this work. Um, one of the things I look for when I invest in companies is I want, I want uh, CEOs that have mortgages and have kids. And, and that is something that, you know, you, you know, it's not a typical question someone might, might, I might ask for, but that means that, you know, they have to perform. So I encourage people to, you know, develop your macro thesis, um, if you believe in gold, well, obviously, you know, gold is a place to to uh, park some of your capital and then don't neglect the fundamentals. And when the two come together, that's where you have a beautiful situation. And um, there's tons of companies like that where you get in the euphoric stage and these things just rip because the macro is supporting the fundamentals and vice versa. All right. Well, before we let you guys go, if Tony, if you could share with our viewers where they can find Tectonic online and get in contact with you guys and also Atavi afterwards, also uh, where they can find you. So for in regards to Tectonic, uh, you know, our website is www.tectonicmetals.com. We do have an info at tectonicmetals.com that you can reach out to. And also you can reach out directly to me. It's uh, Tony at with a Y, T-O-N-Y. So Tony at tectonicmetals.com. Uh, always open to liaising with uh, potential investors, existing shareholders, things of that nature. So please do reach out. All right. And uh, you can find me at, on Twitter at Tavi Costa. You can also uh, find it on our website uh, at uh, crescat.net. And there's many letters and uh, macro research and even videos of most of the companies uh, that we are invested where we share videos to um, to really uh, describe and, and define what the, the whole thesis is behind those. And that's mostly Quentin talking about them. So uh, you can find those in our website as well. Sorry, I was going to mention that uh, some of the people that reached out to me, they've repeatedly complimented your YouTube channel, uh, Tappy. And uh, there, there is a, you know, a, a movement where people are getting educated. And one of them said, I learned, you know, 20 minutes of a crest cap video is the equivalent of two weeks of research because Quentin and yourself, you guys go through all these different companies and their macro. So I would encourage everyone to uh, log on to your YouTube channel. It is a, a library of information if you're interested in investing in mineral exploration stocks. We'll definitely include that in the description of this video, as along with a recent interview that Quentin Henning had with you, Tony. Fantastic interview there. We posted on, on our YouTube channel. We'll also include a link uh, to the one on Crescat. So really appreciate all your time today, Tony and Tavi, and looking forward to speaking again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.